Hello, Antioch Baptist Church and friends. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson coming from Matthew chapter number 2. The title of the lesson was Jesus was recognized as king and we're kind of finishing up what's, what the account Matthew gives concerning the birth of Jesus even though this does not occur really close to his birth. It's you know up to two years later. But, uh, you know, it's again kind of more of what we normally consider the the nativity portion of, of Jesus as life. and But before we go into the uh, lesson this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, just ask you to be in the Sunday School lesson this morning. Just thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for how you are a great and wonderful God, an unchanging God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you're ideals and your notions and your definitions of things do not change no matter what men may try to do men have their ideals men have their worldly wisdom and we even see this somewhat in our sunday school lesson we just how that they try to undo your plans how they try to override your ideals and things and lord we pray that you would just be with us in this situation in our nation where such chaos such anti-God sentiment, such just stoop, just total idiocracy that we see coming from people's mouths these days, and just things that are so contrary to everything that you've established, God, and I just pray our nation, we need help, Lord. We desperately need help in this nation. It's in a day like any now we've ever seen, and it truly is, as it says over in in Second Timothy, it's perilous times. It's savage times. It's terror. It's times. It's going to be very hard to be a Christian going forward, Lord. But we know through the help of Your Holy Spirit that we can face those days ahead. And I just pray it'd be in this Sunday school lesson. Just pray that everything that's said would be a help to those who watch the video. And pray you just lead God and direct in all things. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. But again, last last week we left off and we kind of looked at the birth of Jesus there according to Matthew and one of the key things you notice is he doesn't give us a time period and he doesn't give us a place. He just talks about the fact that Jesus was born there <clears throat> in verse 25 of chapter 1. So chapter 2, we're given a little bit more information starting out here in verse number 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, there were there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So in verse number one here, Matthew gives us to the account that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the province of Judea during the days of Herod the king. So Herod is the king in Judea. He's a Roman appointed king. He is not a Jew. He is a Dumanite, a Dominion. A Dumanite, can't get it right here. He's or of Edomite descendants here, and so he's not a rightful king to be uh, on the throne in Judea. But you know, and he's a very wicked and evil man. He's so possessed with keeping his power and control that he even killed his own wife and her sons in it because he was afraid they were going to try to usurp his power from him. And so he's just a wicked and evil king. So it's during his days that Jesus was born there in Bethlehem. And furthermore, we find out that there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And they came asking, where is the king of the Jews? You know, where is he that's been born the king of the Jews? And Because we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. And of course, they're probably quite bewildered by the fact that they arrive in Jerusalem and nobody, the capital city here and nobody under knows where this king of the Jews is at. I mean, Jerusalem is the historic capital of the Jews. David established it as such. And we see that, you know, they're probably wondering how can it, people in Jerusalem not know where this newborn king is at? And, and so we see, but first of all, we see here in verse 1 talks about how these are wise men from the east. And we don't know exactly where they're from. We know that the word translated wise man here come, is from the word where we get magi from. And so it, you know, these speaks of 
wise men and not necessary things. We often, and we get a lot of mythology in Christianity around this. We say there were three kings and we don't know there were three of these wise men. We just know there were wise men, so it's more than one. Uh, we don't know. We, you know, Some take the fact that they bring three different gifts is indicating there were three of them, but there's, there's no evidence there that will establish that. I mean, two guys could have brought three gifts or 12 guys could have brought three gifts. It doesn't matter how many guys it was, and it's unimportant. We've got a little mythology thinking that there were three kings. We've even given them names in, in certain circles, and we often see them in nativity scenes depicted as being at the manger scene, and we find out in here in this chapter that that's not the case that this is up to almost two years later, even though it still takes place in Bethlehem, they were not at the manger with the shepherds and Joseph and Mary and the babe in swaddling clothes. They were not there. And so get that notion out of your mind. And we often look at these, you know, royally apparent. And they probably were well-dressed men because they were wise men. They were of uh, uh, an elevated status in some nation wherever they're from, whether that be Babylon or Persia or, or whatever, you know, those countries off to that direction and that region, what, you know, who they were, we don't really know. Where they're from, we don't really know. But obviously they had a knowledge of scriptures. They not had, a, had a knowledge of Jewish culture. So they knew that a Jewish king was promised to be born and they... And so, but they, you know, didn't exactly know where. And of course, they went to Jerusalem because where else would you think the king would be born but in the capital city? So obviously, there's probably some bewilderment on their part, even though it doesn't say here, when they keep asking around in the city of Jerusalem and can't seem to find this recently born king. It says in verse 3, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. So this troubles King Herod. Like I said, he was a wicked man. He was very afraid of somebody taking his power. He was given the power to be king by the Roman government. So you know he he wasn't rightly you know entitled to being the king, and so he's very troubled by this. He sees this as a threat, and all Jerusalem's troubled by it because they like you know why are these guys looking around for a king that's born king of the Jews because you know we don't know anything about it, but. It's funny that they should have, because if you go over to Luke's account, when Jesus was born, those shepherds came into the manger scene there, and it says that after they left, after you know the angels had told them to come there and to see the babe and everything, and how that he was you know the son of David, Christ, the son of David, and was born and all this, we see that you know they they spread the message abroad, so they spread the message. It went out and about. In the areas around Bethlehem, at least, and you know, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are only five miles apart. And then on the eighth day, Jesus, you know, Joseph and Mary took Jesus up to the temple to have him circumcised and do according to the law. And Simeon and Anna were there and held and witnessed and saw Jesus and, and, and spread that abroad. So you would think that there would be at least some people in Jerusalem who would be aware of the fact that Jesus had been born. But obviously, around two years have passed at this point. It's probably all been forgot about, what little, if anybody at all knew about it. So Herod's troubled, so he gathers the wisest people he knows. He, these are not necessarily his wise men, but he gathers the chief priests and the scribes, the people who should know about the, Jewish, about the Bible and about the Old Testament scriptures and the prophecies concerning Christ. And he says, you know, he demands of them. He not just asks them. He says, where is he supposed to be born? Where is... You know, exactly. He said, where would Christ, where is Christ to be born? And he wants to, he demands of them. Verse 5, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not thee the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor and shall rule my people Israel. And so here they quickly identify and say, Hey, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And this is quoting from Micah chapter number 5 and verse number 2. And so this is a fulfilling of, of a, one of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ. He's to be born in Bethlehem. And so, you know, 
you take all the evidence, these scribes and these Pharisees, I mean, scribes and these priests, they knew he was supposed to, Christ was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And just a couple of years earlier, the news went abroad out of Bethlehem that he was born, but yet it seems like nobody knows anything about it. It's just amazing how quickly people can forget about something or if, if they even knew about it or just dismissed it when they heard it and didn't think much of it. It says in verse 7, And when, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. So here Herod, being the old sly king, wicked king that he is, he, come, he calls these wise men to him, he talks to him, he says, Hey, you know, tries to you know, interview them more like and interrogate them more or less and try to find out when Jesus was born, when they saw the star, and so he would know about how old Jesus was. And he says, you know, and he, then he sends them to Bethlehem. So he first gets the information he wants before he passes on the information that they were looking for, which was that he would be in Bethlehem. He says, you go find the young child and notice the fact that he used his young child. This is, you know, like we say, about two years later from when Jesus was born. So it's a situation, you know, where he's not, Jesus is no longer a babe in a manger, but he is a young toddler. He's a, you know, a two-year-old. So he's, you know, a young child. Because when you go find him, come tell me where he's at so I can go worship him. Of course, we know Herod has no desire to go worship Jesus. He desires to destroy Jesus because he sees him as a threat to his rule. And then we go on here in verse number... 9 says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And they saw the star. They, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So, they, you know, after the king Herod tells them to go to Bethlehem, they depart and start to make their way to Bethlehem. Like I say, it's only about five miles away from Jerusalem. And again, now the star reappears and guides them directly not only to Bethlehem, but to the house, the very house that Jesus is living in at this point. And so, we, and they rejoice because they've seen the star. Now you say, well, why are they rejoicing because they've seen the star? Obviously, they've lost sight of the star. When they first saw the star, they probably didn't even know what it meant. And this is where I disagree with the quarterly writer. The quarterly writer talks like it took them two years to get from wherever they came to Jerusalem. I disagree I believe, you know, it would have been two years ago when they first saw the star and they probably had no clue what the star meant so they had to study and research and find out what the, you know, and, and get into the scriptures and, 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 and try to put two and two together and figure out that this star indicates that the king of the Jews has been born and once they figured out that then they need to get permission from you know, ever who's, you know, the king or the governor in the province that they're in, give them permission to put together an expedition to go to this, go to Jerusalem to seek out the king of the Jews, because where else would you think the king of the Jews would have been born? But in Jerusalem, which would, has been historically the capital city of the Jews. And so it would have took some time to do that. So you, you're, you're talking several months down the road. They figured out that it's time where he's what the star means and where they need to go. They've got the permission to go. They've got to put together their expedition. This is not a, you know, just, you know, we often see the depiction of just the three kings and maybe get some camels. But, you know, you've got some very valuable treasures that they're carrying here with them. And so, you know, there's obviously going to have some protection, some, some soldiers probably going to have some servants to look after their needs while they're on the journey. And, of course, the animals to carry, you know, to, you know, to ride on or to carry the treasures. So it's it's going to be a several month journey. And so if you figure they're coming from maybe the Babylon or Persia, you know, Shushan, those areas we're familiar with from the exile of the Babylonian exile of the Jews. You know, studying back into the books, you know, the Nehemiah and Ezra and, and Esther, those post uh, Babylon and post captivity books. You know, if we go there and you think about it, you know, the remnant when they returned in Ezra only took about four months to get from where they left there to Jerusalem. So, you know, it's a few months journey for these guys to make their trip 
And of course, this is you know lawless desert, nomads and robbers and thieves. So definitely, they'd have to have some protection because even Nehemiah, you know, was thinking, hey, it'd been nice to have some protection as they were traveling with the you know the, the things that the king had given him, them to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and things. And but you know. He was a little afraid to ask for those things, ask for a guard to go with them and protect them, soldiers to protect them on their travel, but rather, you know, chose to depend upon God. And so we see that, you know, it would have been a dangerous trip. So I, you know, I guarantee you, you know, it's not only these wise men, ever how many there were, but some servants, animals, soldiers to protect them on their way. And so they make their way to Jerusalem in probably just a few months journey. And so it, it it all adds up to where it, you know, it's taken them almost two years' time. They figured out what the stars appearing in the heaven meant, and so they figured this all out. They made their way there, but somewhere along the line, they got in their head they needed to go to Jerusalem. They quit following the star, quit looking to the star for guidance, and basically lost their way. And we can make the application here that, you know, in our lives, when we quit looking to God, we quit looking for His guidance, and we start using our own ideology and our own mindset, and we start following what they, what that encourages us to do, we find, you know, our own minds and our own logic and our own reason, we get out of the way, and we quit following what God does, has for us, and we get in a mess. And, you know, kind of what the situation these wise men got in here. So now they're rejoicing because they've seen the star, they found, they, and it's led them to where they wanted to go, and they found this young child, this new king of the Jews. It says in verse number 11, it says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And so they go into the house, they find the young child again. He's a young child, you know, close to two years old probably at this time. And they see his mother Mary and they fall down and worship him. No wasting around. And they fall down and worship him. They don't fall down and worship Mary. We don't need to get into this ungodly thing of worshiping Mary. Mary's not worthy of our worship. She's just a, the vessel that God chose to bring Jesus into the earth, into the the human family. She has nothing special, nothing divine about Mary. They worship the child. They don't worship her. And today we still should worship the Lord Jesus Christ and not worship his mother Mary because she is not deserving of any worship. She just is a vessel used of God, just as we can be vessels used of God if we will allow God to use us and to be a vessel of honor. But, you know, we've got these three gifts here, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, you can kind of go into the symbology of these different things here. You know, the gold, the kingliness, the frankincense. You know, talking about, you know, you know him kind of his priestly function because frankincense was one of those items used in some of the incenses burnt in the, in the, in the temple worship. And then you got the myrrh, it speaks of death and, and those things. And you, know, you can get into that symbology, but, you know, of how that applies to Jesus, but we won't get into that here. For sake of time, says in verse number 12, says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So after they've found Jesus, rather than going back to Herod, they bypass Jerusalem and go straight back home and don't go back and tell Herod. So that verse 13 says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there till I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed unto Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. So here... Not only do the wise men depart and go back home and do not and bypass Jerusalem and don't go back and tell Herod, but that same night, God comes to Joseph in a dream and says, "Hey, Herod's going to seek the child's life. We need you. You need to take the child and your mother, and you need to go down to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to come back." And we see that Joseph wakes up the next morning and does exactly that. Now, isn't it interesting? God's just provided us with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They're all very highly, you know, of course gold is worth a lot, and but the frankincense and myrrh could also be sold for a lot of money, 
and used to fund this trip down to Egypt and fund their visit, you know, fund their staying down in Egypt, find, you know, find food, find place to live for the period of time down there. And again, this is where I disagree with the quarterly writer. He indicates that they were down there years. There's no evidence for that. I believe it was more like months because, you know, most believe Jesus was born around 6, 5 B.C., Herod died in 4 B.C., so we're, you know, two years forward. We're already basically in 4 B.C. by the time that this event's occurring, so Herod's close to dying anyway, so it's probably just a matter of a few months that they were down in Egypt, not years, and definitely no more than a year at worst that they could have been down in Egypt. So it was not a long time down in Egypt, So, but God provided the means, the gold, the myrrh, and the frankincense for them to have to finance their trip down to Egypt to protect Jesus from, from Herod trying to kill him. And so, but, you know, Joseph immediately does what the Lord says. They go down to Egypt and stay there till Herod was, had died. And, you know, it says again, this is a fulfillment. So we got four different talk, fulfillments here, talking about number one, being born in Bethlehem. Number two, that he would come out of Egypt. And then, so we've got two more that we'll touch on. It says in verse 16, then Herod went... He saw that he was mocked by of the wise man, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and on all the coast, coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise man. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there were, was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead... Well, well, we'll stop right there. So, in the first 16 through 18 here, Herod's very angry because the wise men have deceived him. They didn't come back and tell him where the child was at. And so, having found out from them originally how long ago it had been since they see the star, he goes out and he kills every young boy in Bethlehem and the surrounding countryside of Bethlehem two years old and younger. And so this is going to cause a lot of grief to the mothers of these children and, you know, a lot of, you know, scratching their heads like, why is Herod doing this? What has possessed him to kill all our young boys like this? And so, but then again, it's just fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah here as, the, as, as, as Matthew records. And again, you know, as we said last week, Matthew is big on showing that Christ is the Messiah. He is the promised king and how he fulfills all these different Old Testament prophecies. Again, you know, 129 to 130 different Old Testament prophecies that we see brought out in the book of Matthew. It says in verse 19, it says, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they that they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. So soon Herod's dead, as we said, he died in 4 BC, according to history. He, you know, he's dead. They, the angel again speaks to Joseph, tells him to come back out of Egypt, return to Israel, because you know, there's no longer Herod's no longer seeking his life. And he says in verse, you know, and you'd think if this had been a period of several years, you know, that, you know, you know, Herod wouldn't continue to seek the child's life for a long period of time because he'd think he'd manage to do it by killing all the boys he did. So, you know, a few months period, you know, Herod probably forgot all about this, you know, and, and of course then he dies. But verse 21, it says, and you know, of course, he immediately rose in verse 21 and, and returns back to land. Verse 22 says, But when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, He shall be called a Nazarene. And so, when he gets back to the land, he finds out that Archelaus is Charles here, which is... Herod's son is reigning in Judea, and, and the important thing you got to remember is the land has been split into different territories. Galilee is its own separate territory around the Sea of Galilee. Judea, which is up around Jerusalem, is its own territory. And so Archelaus is now reigning in his father's stead in Judea. And Bethlehem is in Judea, so instead of returning to Judea, he goes to Joseph is directed by God to go into Galilee 
and that, you know, again, that another prophecy would be fulfilled that Jesus would be uh, come from Nazareth. And so we see here that, because he'd be a Nazarene, and so we see here, but, you know, how that, that works. And so, you know, again, Archelaus is reigning there, and Archelaus was a, you know, even just as ter terrible a ruler as his father, or even worse, so bad so that, you know, the Jews besought the Roman government that, you know, he wouldn't be placed as king, and so they made him just governor, and he was so sorry a job at that, that eventually he had to be replaced, and that's where we get Pontius Pilate. And so it, it all kind of plays together, and it's a great study to study the intertestament period in these early years here around Christ's birth and, and kind of better understand what came into place and the, the situation in the land as you reach the days that the ministry of Christ and it helps you to have an understanding to understand who the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these different groups were and to understand how the you know different provinces that were in the land at the time but you know that's kind of getting off on the side so here through this chapter we see that Jesus is recognized as king by these wise men who came to seek him and and they came and worship him and how that God through all this protected Jesus from wicked men. Satan has always been trying to destroy the seed of the woman because all the way back there in Genesis chapter 3, God said it's going to be the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent's head. And so Satan has always been trying to prevent the Redeemer, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from coming into the world so that redemption's plan could be completed. And hope you got a little something out of that and thanks for watching.